Good evening. Well, I'd like to welcome all of you to the Jeffrey B. Graham Perspectives on Ocean Science Lecture Series. My name is Harry Helling. I'm the Executive Director here at the Birch Aquarium at Scripps. And it is my great pleasure this evening to introduce the scientists who conducted the research that you'll be learning a little bit more about this evening, Dr. Charles Ken Kennel and Dr. Elena Uleva. We are honored to have Charlie Kennel giving the presentation this evening. Dr. Elena Uleva is a Scripps Oceanography researcher who is an expert on global and regional climate modeling and analysis. She holds a PhD in, astro in atmospheric sciences from the University of Washington. Her research and development work has focused on high-performing computing, numerical methods in weather and climate prediction, large-scale data management, and data science. In addition, Elena has been running several award-winning youth education programs focused on the environment. Dr. Charles Kennel is a distinguished professor, vice chancellor, and director emeritus at the Scripps Institution of Oceanography at the University of California, San Diego. Educated in astronomy and astrophysics at Harvard and Princeton, after a postdoctoral year at the International Center for Theoretical Phys Physics in Trieste, he joined UCLA's Department of Physics and its Institute for Geophysics and Planetary Physics. There, he worked in theoretical and experimental space plasma physics and astrophysics, eventually chairing the physics department. He served as UCLA's exec executive vice chancellor, its chief academic officer from 1996 to 1998. And from 1994 to 1996, Kennel was associate administrator at NASA, leading Mission to Planet Earth, the world's largest Earth science satellite program. Learning of the climate problem while at NASA influenced him to go into earth and climate science, and he became the ninth director. He became the, the ninth director and dean of the Scripps Institution of Oceanography and vice chancellor of marine sciences at the University of California, San Diego. He now teaches climate science and policy at Scripps. He is also a distinguished visiting scholar at Christ College, Cambridge, visiting every winter since 2012. Please join me in welcoming Charlie and Elena for their talk entitled, Climate Connections from Arctic Sea Ice to the Tropics. Thank you very much, Harry, for your kind and fulsome introduction. Uh, I can't see you because the light is shining in my eyes, but I do remember seeing you before the light was on, and I recognized a number of old friends and new friends, and I want to thank you for coming. Uh, the story I have to tell is uh, some thinking that we've been involved in for the, about the last five years on the variability of Cal California's climate and its relationship to the changing sea ice and trade winds that have been observed in the last uh, 15 or so years. At the bottom, of course, you see different kinds of variability that we all experience. We see fires and floods, of course, and big snows in the Sierra Nevada. And occasionally, when there are clashing uh, weather systems, we'll see a strong lightning storm. So uh, without further ado, I'll tell you how I got involved in this problem. It started all in the year uh, 2014 when it became apparent to the entire uh, climate science community that the models were not predicting the uh, measured global surface temperature. Uh, what you see here is a plot from, uh, from 1950 to about 2015, and the big black line in the middle of all of that is the mean of the predictions for the increase in global surface temperature that would come from 41 climate models. The gray is the spread of those models, and those wiggly colored, colored lines are the measured temperature uh, it, according to two different measurement uh, reanalyses. And so what you see is that by about 2010 or 2011, the measurements diverged from even the most extreme outliers of the models. And uh, so we were in a situation in which you would have expected the global surface temperature to increase, and it was not. This, of course, created a significant amount of uh, impact in the world of climate politics. And many people said, hey, we don't have to do anything about the climate. It's always been variable. And now the temperature's constant. We don't have to worry about it at all. And so that's what that little inset at the bottom means. But the most important issue to me was the fact that the models were not, 
we're failing to get the increase in global surface temperature that was observed, but when you looked at the details, they also failed to get the intensification of the trade winds, the loss of sea ice, and the increase of extreme events that we observed during this period that we now call the hiatus in climate change. The first thing that we, we noticed uh, was that there was a definite increase in extreme events as measured by uh, heat events, heat waves. And a brilliant analysis done by Jim Hansen in 2012 uh, looked at the number, looked at every spot on the surface of the Earth where a temperature measurement was made and asked how many times per year and over what area did the temperature that you measured differ by three standard deviations from the average for that region. And that number, the area of heat waves, if you will, had been about 1% in 1960, and by the middle of the hiatus, it had grown to about 10% of the Earth was experiencing a strong heat wave uh, sometime during the uh, hiatus. So that while the average temperature was uh, not increasing, the temperature extremes were. And of course, it's the extremes and the heat waves that cause most of the damage and most of the concern that people have. And so we realized at that point that the temperature was not characterized, the surface temperature that was the subject of the negotiations in Paris was not characterizing the risks that human beings were running from the type of climate change that we had at this time. So this inspired uh, David, Victor, and me to write a paper just before the negotiations which said uh, you shouldn't pay attention to the temperature uh, as a, as a uh, meaningful uh, goal to negotiate uh, to. And uh, the diplomats didn't listen to us, but people did listen to the fact that if you're looking at a complex system, say, for example, your own health, you uh, will take your temperature, and that certainly means something, but your doctor will give you a whole bunch of other diagnostics and make a judgment based on the suite of diagnostics that the doctor makes. So we recommended the same thing for the Earth. Uh, Stephen Briggs, who was then the uh, head of the UN Global Climate Observing System, joined us and we wrote a paper saying we really needed multiple diagnostics of the Earth's state. And Stephen carried the ball and has uh, made it, uh, has uh, ensured now that the World Meteorological Organization looks at five or six diagnostics of climate change and not just one. And then distributes it. The important thing is they distribute it to the decision makers and the negotiators at the, at the uh, climate meetings. So I talked about heat waves. That was the first indication that climate variability was increasing. Uh, and now I'd like to spend a little time telling you about California's climate variability and uh, basically reviewing a little bit of recent history for you so that you will remember, you will remember all of these events, but perhaps not have them in mind until I list them. First thing to say is, and this, the great historian Kevin Starr wrote it this way, the history of California is written in water, not in ink. And our history is one of flood and fire and drought, El Nino and La Nina. And you see the contrast of drought and, uh, and uh, flooding uh, right in that picture. So if we go back about the time, about the middle of the hiatus in the years uh, 2011 to 2015, you may recall that we experienced a very strong and severe drought the strongest one in, uh, say, California's recent history, four or five years of drought. It got so bad, in fact, that in 2014, the state declared a drought emergency. And the reason had been, of course, that the, the reservoirs, such as the Oroville Dam register here, which had been full in 2011, were almost empty in 2014. And the state water management said, this is not a, uh, this is a real emergency, it's happening now. And you may recall that we were required to reduce our personal consumption of water by about 25%. Well, this situation, we thought we were mercifully saved by an El Nino that took place in the winter of 2015 and 16. And there was a tremendous amount of rainfall, and at that time, uh, the snows in the Sierra Nevada were replenished. 
if you look at this picture on the last, that's the year 2015, uh, and the year 2016 at the end of the snow season, and you can see there's much more snowpack in the Sierra Nevada, and we, are, uh, we were relieved there would no, no longer be a water emergency, the reservoirs were full. That was the good news. But it didn't stop. Two years later, in January of 2017, we got an atmospheric river that crossed uh, from the Pacific uh, and crossed over our coastline. And you can see this river. This is an uh, a image of, uh, of water uh, system. And you can see the river heading north. And uh, it's dumping all its rain on us and later on the Sierra Nevada. Now, we have learned, Scripps, by the way, is the world's best center on atmospheric rivers. And we have learned that a, a good AR transports as much water, about seven to 15 times as much water as is transported by the Mississippi River. And, and this all flows at high altitude over us and then dumps the water on, the, on, the, uh, on California. Now, I've got a pretty picture here that I wanted to show you because it's pretty, but it also shows an atmospheric river intersecting the Sierra Nevada. And what you see is two things. You see at the bottom, at low altitudes, the water is falling as rain, but at high altitudes, it's falling as snow. And it's the water stored in the Sierra Nevada as snow that is the primary source of California's, of the water in the California Water Project. And nearly all of that snow comes from atmospheric rivers. So that was 2017. Just a year later, we had uh, what was then, at that time, the largest wildfire in California history in Santa Barbara and Ventura counties, the Thomas Fire. And it was accompanied by northeast Santa Ana winds that were unprecedented for that time in strength. So we had a couple of El Ninos, lots of water, and then suddenly more drought and a strong fire season. Fast forward now to almost this year, uh, just a few months after that, Camp Fire, Northern California, now the largest in California history, and uh, the one with the large number of fatalities and displaced population. And at the bottom, the Woolsey Fire in Malibu, which threatened a tremendous amount of valuable infrastructure. So that's November 19th. Uh, and then fast forward to this year, okay. Here we are, January 20th of this year, another atmospheric river. It's California, more rain, you remember that. But what you didn't know, or perhaps might not have remembered from the television broadcast, was that at the same time that this was happening on the West Coast, in Central uh, North America, in our Midwest, you could see from the picture inset on the right, you can see the cold Arctic air had intruded all the way into Central America, into uh, our plain state. This is not a proof, but it does suggest that the two events are, could, could be related. So then, uh, <laughs> just a few days after that, you recall, there was another one. So you know that there's the purple uh, atmosphere. This is a, a satellite image of the total water uh, uh, content in a column above that area, and you can see the purple sweeping uh, a vast amount of rain towards the west coast of North America. Okay. And here, I put down at the bottom, I have to tell you that most of what we've learned about these things in recent years has come from a new Scripps Center for Western Weather and Water Extremes, and Marty Ralph is its director. And so I'm very indebted uh, mostly to the research that our guys and gals have done. Now I'd like to get a little bit deeper into at least qualitative physics and tell you that uh, our atmospheric rivers originate as you uh, pull back and look at, over a larger scale, you can see that our atmospheric rivers originate in the Pacific tropics. Okay, there you can see one hitting the west coast. And it originates in the network of processes uh, that also create El Nino events. And uh, the, you can see the little sign, the intertropical convergence zone. That is that long 
band of red uh, uh, high water vapor in the middle there. That's the intertropical convergence zone, and it's the place, now we get into trade winds, it is the place where the north and southern trade winds from the north and southern hemisphere meet in a very turbulent and uh, 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 very turbulent interaction, and that turbulent interaction produces a degree of storminess that is highest, uh, at the highest point at any place on the Earth. And here's what the intertropical convergence zone looks like from the bottom. And what you see uh, from the surface of the ocean is an incredible uh, uplift of water uh, into the high atmosphere, and this water and the convection uh, of energy and water into high altitudes is the primary source of the global atmospheric circulation. This energy injected by the warming of the sunlight in the tropics actually gets into the upper atmosphere and circulates around the Earth. Now here's the simple way that Benjamin Franklin thought about the global atmospheric circulation. It's a little more complicated than that. I'll come to it in a minute. But if you look at this diagram and look at the section that says rising air with low pressure, that is from all of the tropical heating of the ocean uh, causing the warm air to rise to high altitude. It has to go someplace, and so it's happening all around the Earth. So it has to go someplace, and it propagates north and then, or south, and then falls uh, at the poles, and then returns along the surface in a closed circulation loop. And if you look at that uh, from, the, from the front as you do, you can see these curved lines, which, are the, which is the return flow. It would be a straight line if the Earth were not rotating at all, but it's a slight you see a slight convergence there because the Earth is rotating. And so the trade winds then all uh, propagate from east to west, as you see in this picture. But it's not as simple as that. And in the 19th century, people began to understand that the rotation of the Earth really did matter for the dynamics of the atmosphere. And the atmosphere, as it turned out, split up into three cells. Each hemisphere had three cells and two jet streams and a strong trade wind. The top cell, the polar cell, and the bottom cell, the tropical or Hadley cell, behave as you would expect, that the pressure gradients uh, act against gravity and you get uh, convection to high altitudes in these regions. But in the middle, the feral cell, mid-latitude cell, in which we all live, uh, has a different dynamics in which the pressure gradients interact with the centrifugal forces of rotation. And that's of where, uh, where we are. And the boundaries between these two cells are marked by the jet streams. Okay? So we have three cells, two jet streams. And then at the bottom, because of the strong rotation, you can see that the jet streams from the north and the south converge at the equator. And the, the uh, trade winds are very strong there. So we get strong trade winds as well in the real Earth that's rotating fast enough for this to happen. So it is in this area of convergence of, uh, of the trade winds that the El Nino is, uh, is uh, it's operating in that area where the trade winds converge and where there's strong convective uplift that causes global atmospheric circulation. Oh, one of the things that happened, it was a surprise, during the uh, hiatus, uh, when the global temperature was misbehaving, uh, there was a new kind of El Nino. The original El Nino that we had been studying for years before that involved a transient, sudden warming in the eastern Pacific off the coast of Peru, as you see at the top. And that warming would spread from east to west and it was mostly on our side of the Pacific. And there are still El Ninos that li are like that. But there's a new kind now that starts in the central Pacific and then spreads eastward. And uh, so, and the question was, where did this come from? Both of these El Ninos uh, do modulate the 
vertical uplift in the convective regions, and thus they modulate the global climate, but they do so in a slightly different way. Now, the classical El Nino had been the same for at least 5,000 years. The tree ring studies will tell you that there have been wet seasons and dry seasons alternating with a five to seven year period uh, for at least 1,000 years for the pines. And there's a, a, a lake in the coast of, coastal region of Peru whose sediments reflect both rainy and dry years. And that record goes back about 5,000 years. So the El Nino cycle, which had been regular for a very long period of time, there may have been another hiatus at earlier times, but not if our exp explanation is correct, that would not have happened. Um, and so the El Nino cycle has been changed. Now, in order to give you some sense of, of the new kind of El Nino, I'm going to describe to you uh, a little bit about the dynamics of the El Nino system. Now you're looking right at the equator. And to the right is uh, Peru, and to the left is Indonesia, and the win trade winds uh, at the surface blow from east to west. And they, of course, uh, push the water in the same direction, east to west. And as that water flows towards the west, the sun is shining, it's a tropical sun, it's very bright, very strong. The waters heat up. And as they heat up, hot water expands. And so the sea level increases. And at the far end of this diagram, off the coast of uh, uh, Indonesia, is the warmest water found on the planet and the highest water found on the planet. And this is all because the trade winds are continuously pushing uh, water that is being heated by the sun. Now, what is the Central Pacific El Nino? It's rather simple. Uh, something happens. Uh, and you get a small avalanche, an avalanche of ocean water. There's a, a storm, a signal that comes from the Arctic, something like that. And it disturbs this system for the moment. And the water, uh, the trade winds are reduced temporarily. And the trade winds can no, water, no longer push the water uphill. So it's like an avalanche, an avalanche of hot water over the hottest water over the uh, cooler water behind. And that looks to the measurements like a change in temperature. So that's the, that's the new Central Pacific El Nino. And this tells you a little bit about what's happening. But the most important thing is if you look at this diagram, you can see what's important to this El Nino instability. It is the trade winds, it is the temperature, and it is the height of the, sea, height of the ocean surface. Those are the three things that matter. And when they're, uh, when they're in the right circumstance and there's a sudden change in wind from some other reason, then you'll get this El Nino type of instability. So this is where uh, Elena joined the collaboration. And one of the first things that we decided to do was to diagnose for the last, uh, since 1980, including the period before and after the, the hiatus started, to diagnose the conditions in the tropical Pacific. So what we did was uh, we took a band, plus or minus 7 and a half degrees, around the equator. And uh, we, inter we averaged the variables over, the, over that plus or minus 7 and a half degree band. So sea surface height, sea surface temperature, trade winds. <laughs> and then we plotted the whole thing as a function of time. There's longitude at the top. That's uh, eastern Pacific, Peru on the top and Indonesia at the bottom, the date line somewhere in the middle. And it doesn't take a genius for you to see that the, the, while the behavior is variable, it has very different characteristics on either side of 1998 when the hiatus started. And in particular, if you look at the bottom plot, that blue corresponds to trade wind intensification. And we know from the people who made those uh, measurements that those are the strongest trade winds <laughs> encountered in uh, 125 years of measurement. Not only that, but you can see that the trade winds got strong uh, along the date line, and they weakened uh, in the top, which is the Eastern Pacific. This is a characteristic of behavior during the, during the hiatus that did not occur 
in the earlier period. And this, I think, is the most complete diagnosis of the variables that are pertinent to the ENSO system that we have seen. So the bottom lines, just looking at those diagrams, and so system modulates the main power source of global circulation. This has widespread consequences for weather and extreme events, and the system changed at hiatus onset and suddenly. Now, this immediately leads to some questions. What else changed at the same time? Uh, and more specifically, was it Arctic sea ice losses that began at the same time? Did they prompt the transition in ENSO system behavior? And if they did in the Arctic, how were the effects of sea ice lost transmitted to the equator? Those are the questions that Elena and I uh, set out to, to work on. So the first thing to say is what else changed? Well, this is a picture of the Arctic, a map drawn from the North Pole. You don't usually look at the Earth this way, but there it is, the Arctic Ocean. It's in a closed lake. Saltwater Lake in the eastern, on the Pacific sector. And what changed from before and after the hiatus in 1998? Before, most of the heating was over land. After, most of the heating was over the ocean. Not only that, but most of the heating took place uh, at the end of the summer in September and not when this, in high summer in July. Okay? So the pattern of warming changed, and the rate at which warming also changed. So you can see why this warming would occur. Uh, if you imagine, for example, you're in the midst of winter, sea ice is thickening, thickening, and it's spreading out uh, over the whole enclosed Arctic lake, as you can see in this picture on the left in March. And by March, at the end of winter, the sea ice is as has the largest area that it will have that season. And it fills up the whole basin, as you can see. By September, the sea ice has melted, and it has retreated back to the part that you see on the right. And suddenly, then, there's a whole area of ocean, open ocean, that is no longer covered by ice. Why is this important? The white ice reflects about 80% of the sunlight that falls on it. And, but the dark ocean absorb, absorbs 93% of all the sunlight that's falling on it. So when the ocean is open at the end of summer, the intense Arctic sunlight is warming the ocean, and the warming ocean is the warmest and has the largest area at the end of summer. Okay? So here's a little picture, if I can get it to work. Here's a somewhat out of date NASA picture that shows the area of the ocean, uh, the area of the sea ice, if you will, at the end of summer in September. That's typically the minimum area that it's going to have. And you can see it plotting out from 1979, when good measurements started uh, through, the, through time. And eventually, we're going to hit the time of the hiatus. You can see it was variable before the hiatus, but now it's starting to take a serious plunge. And as you know from the newspapers, the Arctic sea ice is, uh, is typically sets a record every other year for the minimum area. So then it was a Scripps paper uh, written by Christina Pistone, one of our students, Ian Eisenman, a faculty here in Ramanathan, that actually measured the change in, uh, in the sunlight absorption uh, before and after, if you will, the hiatus. And what they found was that the Arctic warming actually accelerated during the hiatus, corresponding to the fact that the area of open ocean was more or less increasing every year, the area of hot ocean. So, and, uh, so it accelerated considerably over that period of time. And it was a significant warming compared to what you would expect just from the greenhouse warming. Uh, of the whole globe. So with this information in mind, then we were able to elaborate on a model that had been generated by other people to look at the mid-latitude effects and to see if we could make that model would work also uh, for the tropics. And so this model, then, we asked several questions. 
How are the effects of seasonal Arctic Ocean warming transmitted every September? How far south does the influence of Arctic Ocean warming extend, and can it reach the tropical Pacific? So what most people in this field had worked on was just to understand how that Arctic warming uh, would send air into the upper atmosphere, and then the polar at air would then propagate south and create the famous vortex that you see there. Now that's a, a very current question, still lots of people arguing about it, but what people forgot and what we wanted to look at is that if you see you've distorted also the, the jet stream that says Pacific air, and so you've actually moved the boundary of the tropics around, and it's very hard to move the boundary of a system without changing it also internally. So we asked ourselves the question, do the same things that cause the, the same types of physics that cause the events that we see in mid-latitude, can they and do they extend to the tropical Pacific where they can interact with the instabilities that produce the El Nino? So first thing, of course, is how does that energy from ocean warming get to high altitude? Actually, it's the same process that, uh, on a small scale, the same process that occurs at the equator. Hot ocean, uh, heated ocean causes a vertical convection and hot air and moist air rises to high altitude. Now, in the Arctic, it doesn't happen all the time. Most of the time, there's no convection. You can see, for example, just the layered atmosphere above the Arctic ice here in January. But you can also see in the leads where there is no ice and there's a little bit of warm on ocean underneath and you can begin to see wisps of convection that occur there. Now, that convection reaches its maximum at the end of summer. So here's a, a picture in September of the open area of the ocean. You can see the water vapor above the ocean extending to high altitude, and that is the vertical convection that is rising to, and has to get into the upper atmosphere. And the question is, where does it go after that? Now, th this convection, this convective plume generation stops when the ice refreezes. Here's a refreezing uh, moment right at the end of the, of the convection period. There's still water vapor in the atmosphere. You see the, the uh, rainbow, but you also see that the water vapor is uh, sort of horizontally stratified and is not going to high altitude. So when the refreeze starts, the convection stops. So the uh, next thing, of course, and this is uh, an important piece of data analysis that Elena did, we asked ourselves, you know, to what extent is all the convection that you would see to upper atmosphere associated with the opening of the ocean through sea ice loss. And so what we did uh, is we did a number of calculations using data, and we could plug that data into the criterion for instability, for uplift, and look at the places and times when you would expect uplift to occur. And so, for example, on the left and the right are the dates uh, this is all for data within the hiatus, so these are average dates. But within the hiatus, we find that the uplift actually started at the little set of islands on the right there, September 5 to 15. Those are called the New Siberian Islands, if you're interested. Uh, and then as the sea ice retreats even further and the atmosphere cools even more, convection gets stronger. And then finally, it covers the whole area in the beginning of October, it's covering the whole area between the ice edge, which is that black line, and the coast. So, and the atmosphere is uplifting there, it's blue, whereas it's falling wherever it's red, okay? So, and then finally, we also trace back when the convection actually stops, and we see that the last place where there was convection is about the place where it stopped, but a month later. Now the important thing is that the convection that we see and, and calculate occurs only over the open area where the sea ice has retreated. So the amount of convection, quantitative amount of convection that you would get is going to be proportional to that area. 
Okay? And that's the quantitative thing that enables the statistical analysis that we did later. But the first thing to do was to make a plot of what that open ocean area in the Pacific sector looked like historically. All right, so we took the ocean data and we plotted. Uh, you can see every year that open ocean area increases and decreases, and it's basically at its maximum only for about a month, as we have indicated. Uh, there's three different parts of the plot that are worth looking at, but the main one is the red, which is the absolute value of the open ocean area. And what you can see, amongst other things, is that during the hiatus, the open ocean area, that is to say the amount of vertical convection of hot uh, or warmed Arctic air, uh, doubled uh, during the hiatus or more. The other thing that you can see and this is the important thing for the statistical analysis, each, each of these uh, little convective events, each September, has a slightly different size. There's a variability to it. And so uh, what that suggested to us is that we could uh, use an approach called uh, regression in which we actually look at the data and we let the September sea ice uh, wiggle up and down uh, in the data. And uh, we look for what else wiggles up and down at the same time. And that will identify, but not prove that there's a, that will identify the things that are related to the change in the amount of convection at the end of each summer. And so, uh, and this then was, uh, we were able then to do this. And in particular, what we were interested in is, could we, via this technique, identify the, the upper atmosphere transmission paths by which the changes in the Arctic would gradually approach, uh, uh, go to southerly, more southerly latitudes, and ask the question, would those changes uh, approach uh, the equator? So here was the thing that convinced us we were on the right track. This shows, remember, we've wiggled the Arctic sea ice in September. We've wiggled that minimum area of ice. But we ask, what happened in the months following? How did the atmosphere change? And this is a plot of the change that takes place as a result of wiggling the sea ice in September. This is a plot of what you would see at about 25 or 28,000 feet altitude in the upper troposphere, uh, this is what you would see. And the big red is the, the re really exciting part. That is the change in, in, uh, in flow uh, that extends from the Arctic, from, in fact, the new Siberian island is beginning, and extends all the way down uh, the west coast of the Americas. And you can see that it's beginning to approach the boxes in this diagram where the El Nino is generated. Not only that, but you see something that you don't, didn't see before, and that's the blue spot, which is a flow in the opposite sense. And that flow is the one that creates the super strong, um, uh, super strong trade winds that you see in the central Pacific. So, uh, and, you're, and you just see now a direct teleconnection in the terms of the trade, a direct teleconnection from the places where you know sea ice is being lost to uh, all the way now to approach the equator. The other thing you can do is ask, what is the difference between this situation that seems to be new in the hiatus when we get the, uh, the Central Pacific El Nino and what happened before? So we did the same regression analysis, but we looked at the data uh, for e almost equal length periods from before the hiatus and during and after the hiatus to begin. And you can see for just looking at it visually that the two diagrams differ. The Arctic influence before the hiatus in the 1980 to 1998 sort of gets to mid-latitudes, but it's all broken up and is not coherent at the equator, the upper panel. Uh, and the right, upper right panel is the, the one that we already saw. On the left, there's the surface winds. There's not much of a pattern. But on the right, you see during the hiatus, the very strong trade winds, that blue spot that is generated, uh, 
tr the trade winds that are generated in the Central Pacific. And you see an opposite sense of trade winds, uh, a change in trade winds. They get smaller in the east and much stronger in the Central Pacific. And if you were measuring the sea surface temperature, you wouldn't have seen much happen, not much of a change in surface temperature, but a very large one uh, during the hiatus, including a significant heating in the North Central Pacific, which is something that we have observed various forms of. As, and when it moves around, we, we called it the blob. So as we were doing this, a new paper came out a modeling paper, a theoretical paper, from the very powerful models that they have together they make at the Lawrence Livermore uh, National Laboratory. And they were looking again at the impacts of sea ice retreat, but they discovered that all the other models were wrong because they didn't conserve energy, and it is really the energy of the convective uplift that really matters. But they, in fact, did this job, we think, right, and they discovered a sequence of events that they think occurs. The sea ice retreats, there's a propagation in the north, there's a propagation to the south, it affects the El Nino processes in the middle. You get an El Nino and that creates a reflected wave, there's a wave coming south, reflected wave goes north, and two months later, that wave arrives at the position of the uh, Lucian low, which is that reddish orange blob at the top. That's a low pressure system that is been in the North Pacific for a very long period of time. And we know that the variability of that system is related to the variability of the, of the, uh, of the winds that we see, uh, Santana winds that we see during fire events, for example. So first you get an El Nino event, and then uh, it will create and propel a wave northward. That was their hypothesis. Now they were doing theory and we were doing measurements. And so when we looked at this problem, we actually thought about it about the time that they're, before that we read their paper, but it was an illumination. Um, now you can see, we looked at data, and our data confirms their theoretical model, and in addition tells you that there's a very big difference between before the hiatus started, 1998, and after in the statistical properties of the data. So if you look, for example, this is now February. We sea ice retreated in September, got to the waves, the changes got to the equator in December, and then they bounced back and they went north. And by the middle of late February, this is what you got. And you see on the right the, a wave, a reflected wave from the boxes in the equator that is going northward. Okay, blue, red, blue. Uh, you don't see the same pattern in the earlier period. And if you look at the, actually calculate the average winds that you would get from these two, in these two epochs, you can see that the Aleutian low circulation, that red blob in the north central Pacific is much larger and much stronger. And so this continues to communicate the fact that the El Nino variability is related later to the variability of the Aleutian low, and thus the trade, uh, and thus the winds that will affect us in uh, the spring uh, and summer. Okay. So this is uh, where we are at the moment. Um, we've shown that the convective uplift only occurs over areas of, of sea ice loss. It only, takes, only occurs for about a month in around September. We found the structures that show the, the pole to equator propagation of the Arctic warming. Uh, we saw hints of the interaction with the, with the El Nino system, uh, and we saw an interaction with the Aleutian low circulation. So what does this mean for California? Well, the El Ninos create the atmospheric uh, rivers and the heavy rains and snow events that we see. And secondly, the Aleutian low variability affects the Santa Ana winds and the fire frequency. So these two things are yin and yang of the same result. What, what we can't say with this statistical analysis is, you know, if you have a given sequence of events in the Arctic, what is the sequence of events 
at the equator. Can we explain exactly what happened in the order that it happened? No. But we can say through this analysis that the things that we see, the stimulation or changes in the, in the uh, El Nino area and changes in the Aleutian low are in fact connected uh, on a statistical basis with the changes in the sea ice. So let's stay tuned. Our statistical regressions identify things that have been related to sea ice variability during the hiatus but not before, but they cannot explain or predict what will happen in a given year. But at least we know the components of the system that you would need to uh, understand in order to make decent forecasts. And so that's where we are at the moment. There's much more to be done, but I think we've established the plausibility that it's the sea ice variability that is not only changing the weather in the Midwest, but it's also changing uh, and, and, and perturbing the complicated, partially unstable system that is the El Nino, uh, and that's the system that is affecting us. The two are related. So thank you very much for listening. I hope it wasn't. <laughs>
answer. Um, so how does the, like numerically, uh, the albedo between the like third year ice compare to the first year ice? And uh, are we, I'm, I'm assuming we are mapping how uh, the amount of first year ice versus like um, older sea ice uh, is changing over time and yeah. kind of what patterns. Yeah, I'll, I'll, take, the, I'll take the question uh, in reverse order. Um, it's easy to get the second year ice uh, because you just look at the areas that had ice last year and they still have it this year and that's second year ice. Um, so you know the area of it, and uh, and uh, so um, and th that area has declined dramatically uh, over the period since good measurements were made, 79 to the present, and uh, so that means that the ice is thinning, and you're, and most and the second year and older ice is being replaced by first year ice. The first year ice is uh, is. Uh, so, so irregular uh, that, uh, and, and so variable that when you melt, first there's snow on the surface, and that has a certain albedo, pretty high, reflects everything back. Um, and then as you melt the snow and you begin to have low points in the ice, uh, you begin to have water ponding, and that water on the surface of the ice absorbs, and finally you punch through. Now, it's pretty easy to get the albedo, to, to measure the albedo, easier to measure the albedo of the second year ice because it's got a somewhat more regular surface. But the irregularity of the surface of the CA ice, as you really, really tried to make measurements of radiation in and radiation out, it would depend a lot on the roughness, on the amount of water, and on the ponding. And uh, the, uh, there's never been a really good uh, estimate of how the albedo of the first year ice changes uh, starting, let us say, with uh, July or June or July and changes as you approach September. This is uh, something that you might be able to do with the artificial intelligence and big data by synthesizing thousands of photographs. Um, but at the present time, we don't know how that first year ice albedo changes other than we know that it is a lot lower, and that when you punch through to the ocean, we know that albedo very well. One would expect that the uh, effect of the Antarctic um, region on the climate would be very different because it doesn't have open water, has land. My only question is whether it can inform or test aspects of your theory, which uh, uh, you provide a difference. No, the Arctic is very special because it's an enclosed lake and the ice is on the inside, and the sea ice, the first year ice expands to fill the inside, and that's it, that's as far as it can go. In the Antarctic, the continent is on the inside, and the ice is on the outside, and nearly all of the ice uh, around the Antarctic, with the exception of a few bays inside the Antarctic, are all first year ice, and it grows, and. Uh, and uh, as the season progresses into the cold season, the area of the ice will gradually move out of the Antarctic, near the Antarctic coast, and will go uh, a few degrees in latitude until it covers, uh, until it reaches the very rough uh, ocean in the, in the South Atlantic and South Pacific. Uh, and at that point, the ice is torn up by ocean currents, and so, the dynamics of the ice in the north and dynamics of ice in the south are very different, extremely different. And the big difference comes because the land is on the inside in the south and on the outside in the north. Now, during the hiatus in particular, uh, people have discovered for reasons that are not related to this story that the sea ice area at the end of the growth period in the Antarctic is increasing not decreasing as it is uh, in the north. And uh, originally, people uh, who wanted to persuade you that we had everything wrong uh, would say that it doesn't make sense. Sea ice, Arctic sea ice is decreasing. Antarctic sea ice is increasing. But the two are very different, uh, two are very different uh, uh, phenomena. And, uh, but uh, I think that, that if you ask me for an opinion, which is the more important for determining the climate? 
at the present time, I would say that um, it's the Arctic sea ice that is more important because its variability is so regular and so uh, it, it affects the climate every single year. Um, and uh, so that's my guess. So we're going to have to end there. Thank you for a fascinating talk. Thank you.